Good morning. I have a warning to all my viewers in the great United States. Lock up your women. Buy your houses. Hide your dogs, cats, and children. Go defend the local military installations, because I have in the studio a vicious, dangerous, subversive by the name of Farley Mowat, a man banned from entering your country and who now tells your country to go suck lemons. He ain't coming back unless Reagan apologizes. Farley Mowat. <laughs> Boy, what a publicity hound he is. Par excellence. Oh, if that doesn't Quiet, get please. Ah. Have spoken to. <laughs> I, too, have congratulations, believe it or not, this morning for Sven Robinson, magnificent NDP MP who has kept his word not to hold up Bill C-49 to clear, hopefully, the hookers, forgive the mention of the word, off the streets. But he also has some, in Vancouver and across the country, he also has some very bright news about those of you who want to get away from your spouse. You'll soon be able to do it in double quick time. And then I have a trapper. His name is Peter Dumelich, and he is from Fort St. John. And Peter's going to tell you that a recent decision by the courts in British Columbia has wide op opened the door wide to non-Canadians, investors, and speculators to take control of BC wildlife resources, which should be by law reserved for Canadian citizens and Canadian residents. It's a good story for you people who are going out in these days of depression to shoot your venison, your elk, and your moose, so you will have some meat this winter. But first, after the break, mouthy mort. <laughs> Manna from Heaven, on April 23rd, 1985, Farley Mowat, distinguished Canadian author, even more distinguished than he's written more books than Pierre Burton and Peter Newman combined. He's on a treadmill which makes him untold sums of money, presenting himself at a U.S., uh, at a Canadian airport to go to the United States, and he was demolished. Tell me about it. Not so much demolished as denied, denigrated, and destroyed. It's simple. I went to uh, Malton to fly to the United States under the aegis of the Department of External Affairs originally, but basically to promote uh, Sea of Slaughter, which is a book that just published there. And they refused to let me in. And when I asked them why, they said uh, haughtily, we're not about to tell you. And I said, for God's sakes, why not? And then I remembered at this juncture that my bag was going through the customs and it had my kilt in it. So I left everything and fled and tried to get my bag back, never did. My kilt got to San Francisco, and I didn't. Why were you refused entry to the United States? And I want you to tell me the whole unvarnished truth. You must not take the Fifth Amendment. Why were you denied entry? Couldn't I have a little varnish? No varnish at no all. Varnish. First of all, you attacked a B-52 or a U.S. Air Force plane with a weapon, did you not? No, this was the accusation. After they had tried to uh, sneak by without telling me why they had kept me out, they were finally forced by the American media, which became very involved in this story, into making some kind of a statement. So they searched their files on me, the voluminous files, and they finally came up with this terrible accusation. Farley Mowat is a threat to the U.S. armed forces. Because? Me? Me? Jack? Be because? Yeah. Because. In 1968, I'd been interviewed in Ottawa, and I had perhaps a drink taken. <laughs> it's possible. Uh, and somebody asked me what I thought about the American nuclear bombers that were then flying over Newfoundland on a regular basis carrying hydrogen bombs on fail-safe missions headed for Russia. And I said, it's an abomination. They're, in, they're impinging on my personal airspace. And if they don't quit, I'm going to step out into my backyard with my trusty little 22 and blast them out of the skies. These things were at five-mile altitude. You know, you could barely see the contrail with your binoculars. But, you know, such is the media and such are we sensationalists that that has come across not that you threatened to fire a 22, but that you had fired the 22. Well, that shows the depth of their ignorance. Obviously, I wouldn't have done that. I might have hit one, but what and then was, I would have been vaporized. What was the real sin? 
the real sin was ah, that the real you sin. were a member of the Fair Play for Cuba Committee. No, that wasn't even the real sin. They pulled that one out too, and they pulled out the fact that I had been in favor of nuclear disarmament since I was yay high. Uh, when the story finally emerged at the very end of this episode, it turned out that I was a victim of the most powerful political lobby in the United States, the gun lobby. And they didn't like Sea of Slaughter, and they didn't like what I had to say about sport hunting in it, and they had passed the word they didn't want me. And it's very easy to do that, you know, in the States, because under the McCarran-Waters Act, which is a totalitarian act, if ever there was, passed by in the McCarthy era, they can exclude anybody, anytime, without ever explaining why. Uh, the assumption always is, of course, that you, you're excluded because you're a communist. But if I were a... If I were a United States citizen today, I would say to you quite severely, it's my country. Mm -hmm. I decide who's mm -hmm. getting into my country. Mm -hmm. And you, you foreigner, you're not even entitled to know. If I don't want you, I can turn you around and kick you out. That's not the point. The point is every country has the right to exclude anybody. Right. I mean, you know how many countries you're excluded from. I hate to think. I could count them on the, on the fingers of both hands. Uh, but the thing is the way it's done. And the way this is done is to cast a stigma upon the excludee. The implication is that he is a commie, a subversive, or an anarchist, or worse, and that is intolerable. And the reaction in the United States, Jack, and this was what really, really made me write the book. Made you write the book. Yeah, it must have taken you 25 minutes to write the book. No, it took me about uh, two hours and a half. Two hours and a half. It's yeah. largely that was quotes. Time, time out for lunch. It largely quotes about what other people said about your problem. I finally learned how to write a book. <laughs> Why didn't you just do a magazine article instead of subjecting the public to such a slim book? Well, I tell you why. Because my American friends wanted a book. They wanted the civil rights people there. They wanted this as ammunition to try and get the McCarran Act changed. Also, Jack McClellan, whom you've met upon occasion, eh? He McClellan. lay, on, yeah, he lay on the floor, the old publisher, and he cried, and he kicked his little feet, and he chewed the edge of the rug, and he said, "Farley, if you don't write this book, we're going to go bankrupt." <laughs> because this was manna from heaven. That's right. What is it? Buck ninety-five? Uh, I think it'll be down to that in a little while. What is it? I certainly, I think it's twelve. I don't know, twelve bucks, something like that. Well, you've got to be joking. No, no, no. But it, it'll be discounted. How much is the book? Somebody shout. How much? You see how little interested in money I Take am? Take another shot of the book. Yeah. <laughs> $12.95. I hope you don't sell one. Listen, it's already been discounted for 38 cents in, in, in Simpsons or something. <laughs> Hang in there for a year, and it'll be down to 10 cents. Seriously speaking, though, it is. It was a great issue for the Americans because it's totally improper. Because it does leave a stigma. Mm -hmm. There are lots of people who won't know what a wonderful, beautiful, whatever character you are. Right wing, right wing conservative that I am. You're not an environmentalist, are you? Uh, I don't put it in those words. No. I don't speak no, to no, these no, people no, these no, days. No, no, no. Jobs we need. That's okay, right. Farley, I want to see how much the... We might get some calls from the states about it, too. We'll encourage some calls from Washington State this morning on any of the numbers. Sure. And we shall hear all about this magnificent fight of Farley. It is a good fight. Teach mm -hmm. these damn Yankees a lesson not mm -hmm. to tamper with Farley Moore. And it also taught those damn cement heads in Ottawa a lesson, I hope. Well, how did the cement heads behave? Badly. I mean, what would you expect? These are, I'm not, you, know, you realize what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about elected representatives. You don't expect much from them anyway. No, they I, are, I, we know they're That's right, heads. yeah. But uh, I'm talking about, about bureaucratic that's cement That's the ones, heads. that's the ones. Uh, well, they, they, uh, they shopped me. Now, there's a phrase that most of your, most your audience won't know, eh? Cut your throat, let that's you right, down, dropped right. you, yep. shopped you. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Joe and Brian uh, tried to pick me up out of the dust and pick themselves up out of the dust. But that's another story. But did Joe do a job for you, though? Uh, it's hard to say. He phoned me up uh, the second day after this happened, and he said, Farley, this is a very great embarrassment. The Americans have made a mistake, but we can fix it. Actually, he didn't say it that way. He said, Farley, I think this is a terrible mistake, uh, but uh, we think we can uh, perhaps fix it. Uh, if you are prepared to go halfway with them, they'll go halfway with you. And I said, Joe, I'll go one-tenth of one percent of the way. Send me Air Force One with a letter from uh, Rambo Regan of apology, and we'll call it quits. And you haven't had the letter yet? No, I haven't had Air Force One either. So until you get that formal apology, you will never set foot w within the great United States. That's right. You can never go to Hawaii on holiday. I can jump over Hawaii. Jump skip over. it, skip it. Yeah. Skip away. Yeah. OK, tell Farley what you think of him. After me. <laughs> If a minister
minister is incompetent. She's incompetent in both French and English. And suggestions of racism are totally inappropriate in the context of this question. Panic in the streets for a moment right. there. Here are your friends, admirers, supporters. I don't give a hell what they say to you. Go ahead, please. Good morning, gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Mullet, I have a couple of questions. Uh-huh. Mr. Mullet. Yes, he's listening. I'm listening. I'm all uh, ears. Yeah, uh, the first one is the, uh, the seeming rise of censorship that's going on in this continent right now. Does it scare you as much as it scare me? And the second one is what can the average citizen do about it? I'll hang up for your answer. Well, that's a real toughie. I don't know what the average citizen can do. I know what the few of us who have some position in with the media can do, and that's make a hell of a lot of noise. And it's the main reason, to be quite serious for a moment, why I wrote this book. I was in a unique position. I could bring this issue to the public eye and the public knowledge, and that's why I did it. For you, I don't know. You can push through civil liberties. You can push the ass off your representatives, your political representatives. That won't do you much good, probably. But uh, it's a difficult... It has no solution. Some forms see. of censorship are essential. Yep. Is well, that correct? Oh, yeah, but I don't want to get into a long discussion about censorship. I would agree censorship is yeah. bad. Go ahead, please. Good morning. Good morning. Mm. Congratulations, Farley. Somebody has to show the Americans they can't walk all over us just because we're Canadian. Keep it up. Thank you. Thanks, dear. Go ahead, please. Hello. Yes, you, sir. Uh, yes, I'd like to uh, ask Farley Mullen a question, too. Uh, when you wrote that book to your people, did you go into the Hudson Bay country with a guy by the name of Frank L. Farley from Camrose? That was my uncle. He was the guy who introduced me to the Arctic. He took me up to Churchill in 1935. Did you know Frank? Yes, he was my dad's cousin. Son of a gun. Hi, cuz. Yeah, so, my name is Dennis Farley. Oh, you're related. Must be. Yeah. Must be. There aren't that damn many Farleys around. The only, I only know four, and two of them are dogs. No, I, I mean, it really does. Here. <laughs> I presume Frank's gone to his great award. Mm -hmm. Has he? I think he has. I'm not yeah. sure. Yeah. Thank you very much. Go ahead, please. Yeah, Mr. Mullen, I'd like to ask you what you think about uh, the censorship on record albums and so forth. I don't know. I uh, know absolutely nothing about that, and I'm always prepared to admit my ignorance, unlike some people that I could name but will, will refrain from. Thank you very much. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Hello? Good morning, ma'am. Uh, yes, I didn't know you were going to be on. I'm very pleased. I just finished reading your book, The mm. Best... Uh... Yes, ma'am? Yeah, it's the best uh, reading I've had for months, and so I've written a letter to you, and I'll just quote one teeny little bit that I hope you're not going to get a prize for humor because I think the warning that you've given us is the most important part of the book. Thank you. That's but, it. But you know, warnings that are wrapped in humor are much more digestible. Well, I agree. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Paul River. Go ahead, please. Good morning, Mr. Webster. Uh, Mr. Mowat, I did not like your mocking of Joe Clark on, on the program or Brian Maroney, and I did not like the mocking of Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan happens to be a very prestigious president of the United States, and I hope you don't do that in the future. You know, I'll take your words to heart, and I'll never do it again until next time. Because it's very insulting. Mm-hmm. Well, I feel grossly insulted by all three of the gentlemen you have mentioned. I'm only fighting back. Go ahead from Kelowna. Yes, I, I've been a fan of uh, Mr. Mowat for years. And, uh, however, on, on this particular point, I do disagree because I think this is how this whole world got into the trouble that we have been in. Uh, he's taken a stand here at this particular point in time that I think should be better solved by talking rather than uh, uh, saying, well, you know, these assholes and, and stuff like that. Mind your language, sir. I will not tolerate it, not even for what. I shall cut you off at once. That is censorship. Absolutely. Is, and you censored sen this poor guy. I censor for bad yeah. taste. Right. Right. And neither of us has ever been accused of bad taste. Never. <laughs> Never. Go ahead, please. Hi. I'd like to know from Farley Mart when you're going to start smoking. Oh, he's caught me out. I'll stop smoking when uh, my friend here stops smoking. That's a cop out. <laughs> Thank you very much. We're both ashamed of ourselves. Mm. Go ahead, please. Hello, Jack? Yes. This is, uh, I'm from Langley. I'm phoning. I'm watching your program. And I, I think if there's more people like Mr. Moffat, I think we would be in a better world. I have to just to speak up. And I enjoy your program very much. I watch it every morning. Good. Thanks very much. And don't forget to buy Farley Moffat's book. <laughs> That's exactly it. I don't care what they call me as long as they're nice. Go ahead, please. Oh, hi. I'd just like to point out that uh, 
the Canadian government uh, as well is not um, exempt from doing the sort of thing that uh, I guess Farley has been subjected to. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you mean, refusing to let people into this country? Yeah. Anybody who enters or lands in this country has a right of a hearing and a right of appeal to the highest court of the land uh, to decide whether or not he is desirable or undesirable or deportable or non-deportable. We have a fairly wide open procedure under our Charter of Rights, well, which the uh, Americans have never be, had. Well, that may work out in, in, uh, in practice, but, uh, for example, I'm thinking of an example in the 1970s, uh, a well-known... Uh, South American sociologist named Andre Gunderfrank, who was going to be attending a, a conference of sociologists. What was his sin, Mr. Oh, Gunderfrank? Pardon me? What was his sin? What was his sin? Well, yeah. he's a Marxist. Oh, I see. Thank you very much. We're sorry we let him out. We'll let anybody in. I don't know why we should stop a simple Marxist, do you? No, we let in mafia people. You know, when, when the, the Atlantic Cable Television did uh, a piece on this whole problem, right. when I was doing it, and they got a chief, one of the chief guys from the INS, the Immigration and Naturalization Service, sometimes known in the United States as the Inquisition and Nazification Service. But they had this top guy uh, on camera, and the hostess was really pushing him to the wall about excluding me. And he got very defensive, and he said, but you know, he said, we, uh, we exclude rapists, arsonists, uh, people like that, uh, prostitutes, not just Canadians. <laughs> uh, go ahead, please. From Campbell River? Yes, from Campbell River. Hi, Farley. I think uh, you're one of the greatest authors that ever wrote a book or an article. But uh, would you take me off the air for just a second? No, I want I'm to ask sorry. Something which will not embarrass you, but which uh, I need to. Where is he? Where is he? Ask me. You're off the air. Come on, quickly. No. No, no, no. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Are you going to tell me what it was? No. Uh. <laughs> Go ahead from Victoria. He just wanted to know where you were staying, and normally you don't give out the name of your hotel. No. Go ahead, please. Good morning. We really enjoyed the aptness of each of your initial remarks, Mr. Mowat referring to his kilt as a bow to your Scottish ancestry and your reference to the First Amendment, which suited an American topic. Uh, I wanted to tell Mr. Mowat that a few years ago, we heard him um, introduced with a slip of the tongue as Marley Fullett, <laughs> and we have enjoyed referring to him that way ever since. But I'm astonished that they did not give you honorary American citizenship, because what could be more American than standing out with your 22 in your backyard potting away at airplanes? <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you, he's not only, he's also known as a hardly know it. <laughs> Thank There's you. another version, too, but I'm not going to give it to you. <laughs> no. Go ahead, please. Hello. Hello. That's you, sir. Yeah. I um, just would like to say I've met Farley Mowat before I'm back in Port Hope in Coburg, Ontario, and I just want to know, uh, you know, I'm glad that he's done something, he's doing something standing up for Canadian people and against the Americans, and I'd just like to know why he left Port Hope and moved to the East Coast. Why did you leave Port Hope and move I to the East Coast? I haven't. I live uh, six months of the year on the East Coast and six months in Port Hope. Uh, the reason I come back to Port Hope is that we have a, a radium and uranium refinery in Port Hope. And by coming back there, I get six months of free radium baths. I don't have to pay a nickel for it. And I get totally revived, reinvigorated. reinvigorated. You should try it. You recommend it? Yep. You will go. You'll slip across the border. I understand you've slipped across the border once without identifying yourself. Have you since this? I would never do a thing like that. And you won't no, go no, no, until no. Rambo Regan, Let's your phrase, mm -hmm. sends mm -hmm. an apology into Air Force One. Actually, Jack, the word is out through channels that any time I want to cross the U.S. border anywhere, nobody's going to say a bloody word to me. But I'm not going until I am taken off their so-called lookout book. This is the, uh, the crux of the matter. This is this book which has some 50,000 names of foreigners on it mm -hmm. who have been excluded under the McCann Act and who have no recourse whatsoever. There's no damned way that I would take advantage of my position to go. I certainly hope I'm not in the lookout book now because I've been nice to you. You want to bet on it? So you're a horrible person. That's <laughs> official for the U.S. INS. Dreadful person. I don't like him. I have nothing to do with him. I never see him socially. I've never been in any committees with him. He's uh, read my book. Look, look, look. Thanks, Farley. Sven Robinson, serious topic after the break. Oh, no, just a minute. Just a minute. Just a minute. Riku, Riku, Riku. Riku. Autographing at Eaton Centre today at half past 12. And that Cody's book in Port Coquitlam at half past seven. One good turn Thank deserves another. That's right. Thanks, Farley. <laughs> After the break, Sven Robinson. <laughs> Hello. 
Who would have thought that the NDP, and least of all Sven Robinson, could be accused of having been racist in the House of Commons? Watch this. If a minister is incompetent, she's incompetent in both French and English, and suggestions of racism are totally inappropriate in the context of this question. I think it was Nielsen that accused you of racism, Sven, was it not? It was indeed, Jack. We'll come to Suzanne Blay Grenier and her magnificent expense accounts on her trips to Europe. But first of all, C49 has now passed committee stage, has it? Yeah, it passed committee stage yesterday, Jack. When will it become law? It's got to go back uh, to the House for third reading. It's a very slim bill. There's just effectively one clause in the bill. Uh, we've got a one-week recess coming up next week. And I would assume that uh, if the Tories are serious about passing it, which they seem to be, that uh, it will be on the law books by the end of this month. And you did not hold it up, as was your guarantee. Even though you despise the bill, regard it as an infringement of civil liberties, and you say that in this form it will not work. The bill is, is, is a disaster for a lot of different reasons. It does nothing whatsoever to deal with juveniles, with kids on the street. It can't. Other than to throw them in jail. And that's not the answer to the it problems of It uh, can't deal with kids. juveniles throwing them into jail. Well, that's exactly what the bill does, is allows kids to be thrown into jail. The juvenile hole is a big hole that we all know about, which has been existing here since time immemorial, and which is within provincial jurisdiction largely, is no, it not? No, 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 absolutely not. Fraser Commission made some strong recommendations in terms of going after customers of juveniles. This government's done nothing. It yes. does, the bill does nothing whatsoever, effectively, to go after customers of, of prostitutes. Well, I happen to think that the bill is not a good form of what people were looking for, but at least the test will be on the table, and this time next year we'll be able to analyze better if it was a total disaster or a partial success, right? It's going to go through. Now, what I want to talk about principally this morning, because you opened my eyes, I had missed this altogether, are the new provisions for divorce in Canada, in which you've been involved in getting some amendments, I thought divorce was dead simple now, and you could virtually walk away from a marriage after a simple three-year separation. What's going to happen to the divorce laws? Okay, what's happened is this bill has been working its way through, uh, through Parliament, uh, Jack, with virtually no press, and it's uh, the first major overhaul of the Divorce Act since 1968. Uh, as it now stands, you have to wait at least three years, in some cases five years, before you're entitled to apply for a divorce on the grounds of living separate and apart. The most important thing that the bill will do is reduce that to one year. And it's effective the day the bill comes into it, the, the, the bill is, uh, becomes law. So in other words, if you've been living separate and apart for at least one year, if your marriage is broken down, you've made an effort to, to keep it together but it, it's failed, uh, you're entitled to apply for a divorce after, after one year. How does that compare with the divorce by separation by living apart legislation in other countries, say in the States or in Britain? Well, it, uh, it depends on the jurisdiction. The states, uh, it uh, goes state by state. So there's some states which have quickie divorces, of right. course, Nevada and so on. There's others which have periods of a year, two years, three years. But this is really revolutionary, is it not? One year separation, one year living apart, uh, and uh, can either party apply for it after one year? Yeah, not only can you apply for it after one year, you can even apply for it within the year, as long as at the date that the divorce is granted, you've been living separate and apart for at least one year, you're entitled to your divorce. So you might come to a decision after nine months, start it in process, and be divorced a year to the day for which you went through the form of marriage. That's right. Now, there's some people who say, well, look, this makes divorce too oh, easy. it does. Makes it divorce does. too easy. It means it can fall out over some silly little spat. We'll have another flood of single mothers with six-month-old babies. No, I think that what we have to recognize, Jack, is that we're dealing here with marriages which have broken down. And the question is, if the marriage is broken down, if the partners just can't reconcile, let's not make it more difficult. Let's Psychologically, of course, it also gives the attitude, well, let's get married anyway. If it doesn't work, we can be divorced after a year. Makes divorce that much more simple, does it not? Well, I don't think it makes divorce more simple. I think it recognizes that when, when a marriage has broken down, that the courts shouldn't be adding to the pain and suffering. Now, the House of Commons is, uh, no doubt, this will, this is a government legislation. This is government legislation. Which you played a part in amending bits yeah. and pieces of it? Yeah. And it's going to go through? Oh, it's, in fact, it's gone through the Justice Committee, and it's going back to the House of Commons. There's some other things that are important in the legislation. Tell me. Uh, for example, what it does is, uh, is it removes most of the fault grounds. You know, the old mudslinging of trying to prove adultery and prove cruelty. and Which you had to do if you were trying to get it in less than a three-year living apart business. Exactly. Now, by reducing it to one year, hopefully there's going to be a lot less of that. They've still kept the grounds of adultery 
and cruelty. But if you can get it within a year, hopefully you're not going to be trying to pin blame on one another. In other words, if you can get it within a year, you don't have to rely on the grounds of adultery or cruelty. Exactly, and that's caused real problems for kids in particular. Is the legislation now, uh, how about the division of assets? Uh, judges always have discretion in the final analysis, don't they? But, but on the face of it, is it simple? And if it is, tell me. Well, yeah, there have been some changes in the, uh, in the criteria for awarding of maintenance. Right now, one of the biggest problems is uh, women who are awarded maintenance, but whose former husbands don't pay. 85% of them don't pay. So what does the woman do? She's trying to raise a couple of kids. Goes on welfare, part-time job, chases right. him. So the bill makes some improvements here, Jack. What it does is, first of all, it, may, it gives access to federal and provincial government records to help track the guy down. Uh, not income tax records, but for example, unemployment insurance records and Family so on. allowance records. Family allowance this records. This will help the husband who, or the, the wife whose husband has fled with the kids to go to the provincial, no, the federal mm -hmm. family allowance and get the address of the last check mailed. Absolutely. Make a hell of a difference. Yep, yep, that's a major improvement. That's a good one. Yep. The other thing it does is to allow the garnishing of federal payments. So if the husband, for example, hasn't been making his, uh, his maintenance payments and the woman knows that he's getting a, uh, an income tax refund or something like that, uh, that can be garnished sheet. Can't be done now, it's an improvement. Okay. But can she find out from the income tax if he's going to get a refund? Or would she just garnish his tax anyway? No, what she'd do, she'd get a garnishing order and then she'd, uh, she'd apply it uh, in different places. So, I mean, it, it, it improves the position of the mother because what we've seen is that after a divorce, the financial situation of, of, the, of the woman goes down and the, the financial situation of the father goes up. Uh, this is really a side, but what do you do if a guy doesn't want to pay? And you know guys often, because of the bitterness or whatever, don't want to pay. When you nail them for contempt, do you put them in jail? Because what happens, he comes up in court and says, well, I'm living common law with Susie Q, and she's separated from her husband, and I'm raising her three children, and I got no money anyway. You know that's the end result of many maintenance appearances. Well, and the guy walks away. Well, that's right. But there's still a very serious problem in this area. Oh, yeah. I think what we should be doing is looking at a system similar to that in Manitoba, where they have a provincial enforcement agency, so the woman doesn't have to go into court. It's handled through that uh, central agency. And in fact, the thing makes money. Uh, they've made more money by collecting in, uh, uh, maintenance payments from the, from the fathers than they uh, would have before in terms of paying out welfare to the mother. But there's one other area, Jack, uh, you know, this isn't just a one-sided bill. What we also heard from were a significant number of fathers who said, as it stands now in the law, in too many cases, fathers are shut out of the system. Uh, they want to be involved with their kids after the divorce, but in some cases, the mother doesn't allow them to be involved. And for those fathers that do want to be involved, we got some improvements in the bill. Uh, for example, the mother has to notify the father if she's going to be moving. Sometimes she'd take off and the father wouldn't even know. Uh, the father's entitled to, uh, to medical records, to school records, to dental records, and so on. Uh, in the awarding of custody, the court has to take into consideration which parent is most likely to keep the contact with the kids. We didn't go far, so far as to have a formal presumption of joint custody. We felt that that would be going too far at this stage, but what we did say is that there is a problem now in terms of the father's position. Total division of assets. Uh, there was a famous case in the prairies. Is it now clear in all divorce legislation that after a solid marriage of some period, the woman gets 50? It's not nearly as clear as it should be. No, in fact, that's not absolute rigid law, even in a lengthy marriage. No, and uh, one of the problems is in terms of entitlement to pensions. It's still not clear that the woman is entitled to a decent pension. Uh, in fact, the biggest single problem with this bill uh, now is that it changes the law so that a woman, for example, in her mid-50s, who's been married for perhaps 30 years, working at home while her husband was out in the workforce, gets a divorce, and the judge says, you've got three or four years to try to find a job gives her maintenance for three or four years. She doesn't find a job and she's out in the cold. But in the, And she's entitled to half any of his company pension in due course. Well, she may be, but that's certainly or not... Uh, whatever his pension happens to be. Sure. Is that not... That's not absolutely statutory. At no. Time. It's still the discretion of the judge. Still discretion of the judge. But it's a big improvement anyway as far as the maintenance enforcement is concerned and it's much easier divorce and will further shatter the solidarity of the family system in Canada, with which you disagree, but I'm not going to argue with you about it after the break. <laughs> Now, what about your nasty attack on poor Suzanne Blay-Grenier? You know perfectly well that any attack on a French-Canadian cabinet minister 
is interpreted as a racist attack. Now, why did you do it? Well, look, Jack, this is a government that has been cutting away at social programs, cutting family allowances, cutting old age pensions, cutting environment programs. Well, what do their ministers do? They go junketing off to Europe at taxpayers' expense. <coughs> Suzanne Blay Grenier spends Easter in Paris. She's got one meeting which she set up as a phony kind of excuse to justify her trip. It lasted two hours, and for four days, she had a limousine standing by with a chauffeur. It's not funny. No, it's our a, money. This is our money. It's, what did it know, cost that limousine for four days? $1,700. Seventeen hundred dollars. And the total bill was what? I mean, sixty-four thousand dollars. For how long in Europe? She was there for two weeks. Two weeks. Uh, that, there were two separate trips, actually, Jack. And what she did is she decided that she wanted to see the countryside in Brittany. So she went up uh, for four days. She hired a chauffeur-driven limousine. She took her husband, her chief of staff, and her chief of staff's girlfriend. They drove up to Saint Malo. She erected a cross. She said it was made out of Canadian wood, and that's why she was there. And that was the only thing that she did for four days, and we have to pick up the tab for that. Scandalous. You know. But that's over and done with. It's dead. Well, it's not dead. It's Who's not gonna, dead. Who's going to... I mean, it's just one of those things which uh, Moroni tolerates. Well, I think when Canadians voted, I guess it was over a year ago, what they were looking for was a change. I mean, you remember the waste of the Liberals. Well, yeah. I don't think Canadians voted for more of the same, Jack. At the same time, the government's cutting back on basic social programs. It's but, wrong. Uh, and uh, the fact that she's done this, and it's a patently, in my view, an improper use of public money in yeah. some ways, that's it over and done with. So if you've got majority, you can bury any of these little scandals, can't you? Well, you can bury them, but I think ultimately it's up to the people the of Canada. Must. I want to get yeah. the phones. I suspect we'll get a lot of calls on the new Divorce Act more than anything else. I hope so. The amended Divorce Act. Right. Go ahead to Sven Robinson. Morning, Jack. Morning. Sir. I've got a question on that uh, new divorce act. Mm -hmm. Right. If uh, the new law is passed saying that men have uh, access to medical, school, dental records, school records, and they also have to be notified if, in fact, the uh, woman plans on moving. Yeah. If, uh, if the woman go, went ahead and moved anyway, mm -hmm. with the, what uh, punishment is she uh, likely to incur? What could happen in those circumstances is that, in fact, uh, custody, uh, the order of custody could be varied and custody could be, uh, could be granted to the father. In other words, there'd be evidence of her misbehavior and it could be, she, he can take it back to court. Exactly. If she's not prepared to facilitate that access, then uh, the courts can say, look, we don't accept this and uh, we're going to uh, change the access. Do we have uniform enforcement of custody orders across the country yet? Well, in theory, we do, but it's still very difficult. If you're in Nova Scotia, Jack, and the children are in, uh, in British Columbia or Alberta, uh, if you haven't got a lot of money, it's very difficult to enforce that. Thanks order. for your call, sir. Go ahead, please. Yes, Jack. Go ahead. Yes, I wanted, is this act going to help, help a stepfather? I'm a stepfather. I have custody of one of, my ch one of my children. My wife has custody of the other two, and she refuses my one son to see his other brother and refuses me to see the children. Is there anything I can do about it? I'll hang up and wait for the answer. Okay. Under the provisions of this act, you would have the right to apply for access to, uh, to your children, uh, your, your stepfather, but to the, um, to the stepchildren. You'd have the right to do that. And the new philosophy of the act is that it's a good thing to keep that contact between the, the father or stepfather and the children. So uh, I would hope that this would have an effect on the You, you did not go as far as to a presumption of joint custody. We didn't go as a, to a presumption of joint custody. We were concerned there, Jack, that if we forced joint custody on two parents that were fighting and bickering with one another, that that wouldn't be good for the children. Go ahead, please. Go ahead, please. Huh? That's you. Uh, Sven, um, I'm a little off the subject. I, I was just, um, I was on, uh, just starting on UIC, and uh, I went to the office and they said every. Like every two weeks, we can give you assistance until you get... Never mind. Hold on, and we, we, we'll take your number off the air, and, you, and we'll give it to Sven for later, if you don't mind, Sven, eh? Yeah. Because he's just taking right away from everything. I can't see him else. Go ahead, from Crescent Valley. Yes, this is... When, uh, this, I just wanted to know. Um, like, I've been separated from my husband for five years, mm -hmm. and he hasn't made any support payments, and I've got my custody of my kids, mm -hmm. and I want to get a divorce. But it still costs just as much now as it as it would have back then, and all that all they have to do is file the papers. I wonder if there's going to be any lower lawyer costs for this. Yeah, that's a very important question, and it and again that's an area that we've made some improvements in. What we've said is that uh, 
if in fact there's not a dispute over custody or maintenance uh, the, and, and you've lived separate and apart for at least a year, that there will be provision for you not to have to go through the court, that you can get the divorce decree by approval of the judge without having to go through the court. And any of you that have been in the courts for these uncontested divorces where they just put them through, it's like going through a, go, running through a hurdle every 20 minutes. Great. Uh, and that, that's, what, that's where your lawyer's fees uh, mount. Are you uh, telling me that under this system an uncontested divorce will be simpler than it presently is? Absolutely. What we've said is that under the rules of the court by each province, that they can make provision for, a, for the ordering of a divorce without a court hearing. It still has to be approved by a judge, Jack, but it can be done without a court hearing. Documents, fairly simple documents. If there is no fight about custody or no fight about money, yep. it should be a simply prepared document, sworn out, affidavit, and all the rest of it goes to judge and that's it. Absolutely, because right now it costs a lot of money for these court appearances, which in many cases are completely unnecessary. Now, here's the, this woman has got a problem with money. She would have to give up her money to get the, I mean, she's not going to get the money anyway. Well, it sounds to me like this woman wants her divorce, and if she wants her divorce, then it seems to me that she shouldn't have to go through this uh, this court hurdle when she hasn't. She's struggling to survive and not getting any maintenance payments. We might do a fair question, and let's do a fair question. And what it what what it costs now for an uncontested divorce, in the simplest fashion, where there is no maintenance, no custody. Yeah. Let's do that. We'll do that on the air for you, ma'am. Thanks very much. I haven't done a program like this for years. It badly needs doing. Yeah. There's been no publicity about this new divorce. Not act. at all, no. Go ahead, please. Hello? Yes. Yes, I'd like to uh, find out. Uh, I I uh, had used to have custody of my children and see them like on a twice a week or once, you know, a couple times a month or whatever. Mm -hmm. And one day I had uh, two police officers show up at my place and they were accusing me of uh, sexually assaulting my youngest uh, daughter, who at that time was about uh, three and a half, three, somewhere around there. Right. So. I was very upset and everything else, and finally it all got cleared and that. So what I decided to do is that I wanted some information about the, uh, you know, why this was going on and stuff like that, and maybe she was uh, going out with somebody that uh, was doing it all this. And every time I talked to uh, the MHR, because she was on welfare and stuff like that, that uh, they just sort of said, well, we don't know anything about her and we're not uh, allowed. Well, you were obviously very perturbed, and perhaps rightly so, because the allegations of sexual abuse against father have greatly increased since the publicity about sexual abuse. Some of it may all be true and some of it may not be true, because the moment you get mention sexual abuse against the father, he's dead in the water, mm -hmm. proven or not proven, right? Right. And I mean, there's something we can't avoid it. Nobody's to blame for it, but something we've got to guard against. Nothing in this can help him in any way, can it? No, nothing in this act will help him, but uh, one of the things that is happening right now is the government to uh, long overdue is looking at the recommendations of the Badgley Commission on child abuse and sexual abuse. That was a good report, too, which good did report. not get the attention it deserved. Yeah. Another segment of calls with Sven Robinson after the break. Go ahead to Sven Robinson. Yes, Jack. Mm -hmm. Good morning. Morning. Um, I was just wondering. Carry on. Oh, I see. Um, yeah. I was just wondering, when does this come into effect, and um, is it in effect now? No, the bill has passed Justice Committee. It's going back to the House uh, probably about 10 days from now, and uh, I would assume that it's probably going to be law by the end of this year. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Hello, Mr. Robinson? Yep. Uh, yep, a lady has been divorced and she has two children and she remarries uh, and the, uh, the former father's uh, father has uh, access to the children mm -hmm. now who uh, does he pay uh, any uh, support well that's up to the courts um, the courts will make a decision both on access and on maintenance they'll look at the, the the woman's income they'll look at the father's income and they'll make that decision in many cases in fact most cases uh, there will be an order of maintenance yeah thank you go ahead please Yes, Jack. Uh, I have a question for Mr. Robinson. Um, I have custody of my two children now, and uh, it's taken me. I've had these uh, the children returned to me. Their mother passed away. Mm -hmm. Returned to me, but uh, there was an interim period of some two years when they were not in my custody. Mm -hmm. um, there is also, uh, you know, uh, support money, uh, pension plans, and so forth that are are uh, payable. 
to the children for their on their behalf and for their benefit. Mm -hmm. uh, the question I have is that uh, is there any procedure through the courts that I can recover on their behalf monies that have been should have been paid to them that has not been paid to them solely because the courts have been so slow in in granting uh, formal custody back to me as a parent. And uh, in this interim period, all this money has been paid to a second party. I hate to say it, but I think you need a lawyer. You know, it's yeah. a pretty complicated question. It may be that you're entitled to something back, but uh, I just can't answer it based on what you said. Go ahead, please. Yes, good morning, Mr. Robinson. Good morning. Uh, the question that I have is that I have my minutes of settlement in my divorce. I have mm -hmm. my order NISI, mm -hmm. and I have just received my order absolute at yeah. great expense. Yeah. Now I have a problem settling the minutes of settlement, in other words, the division of assets. And I was wondering how I could do that without going back to Supreme Court at great expense. I'll hang up and let you answer that, please. I think You're the doing your lawyer bit this morning. That's, I haven't done my lawyer bit for seven years, Jack. Uh, no, I think the short answer is that unfortunately uh, you do have to go back. It's usually the registrar that has to settle this, uh, an officer of the court. Go ahead, please, from Cranbrook. Good morning. What I'm interested in is I understand that this is going to be passed shortly. My three years is up and there's there's nothing that can be contested or anything. There's no mm -hmm. children involved. Would I be better to wait for this new one to be passed or would I be better to go ahead now? Well, if you're not in any great hurry to get remarried, I'd suggest you probably wait because you may very well be able to get the divorce without having to go through the five or six hundred dollar court hearing that uh, you have to go through now. Thank you very much. That's good advice. Let me get that clear in my mind. That uh, present uncontested divorce costs well, I've heard, the figures that I've heard are yeah, five, six hundred dollars. And you think that it may come down considerably when the new act comes through? Certainly should. Well, we'll find out about that locally anyway. Go ahead from Cam Loops. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I want to comment on the Divorce Act itself. Um, I think many of the parts that Mr. Robinson points out in the bill are good, but I also have to agree with Mr. Webster that uh, it does make divorce a lot easier. When you think about uh, some of the major difficulties in a marriage, and I'm sure each situation differs from, from another. Uh, granted, some very serious situations arise, but a lot of divorces simply uh, re uh, result rather out of uh, incompatibility, and that's a pretty easy thing to brush a marriage off on, and after a year, uh, I don't believe that that's much time to... Uh, Not enough time to test the relationship. Well, but That's right. I think it should be much much more uh, difficult to, to get the divorce itself. But I do agree with the points in the bill, and, and I'll hang yeah. up and let Mr. Robinson comment. Okay, well, I think one of the things that we should be looking at far more is trying to keep marriages together and make marriages work. More, more funds, for example, for, uh, for family, family uh, counseling programs and so on, so that we try to keep those marriages together. But once they've broken down, it seems to me that uh, we shouldn't be forcing people who want to separate to go through this crazy setup now, for example, where one part or, part acu partner accuses the other of adultery. They go through this, uh, this charade of hiring a detective. Know, you know, it, it's a crazy setup. It does harm to the kids. Uh, if two people have made that decision that the, the marriage can't work, that it has to come to an end, let's not aggravate the pain and suffering. Let's try to make, uh, keep marriages together instead of... Yeah, but many rocky marriages, uh, rocky, stop, get through these phases and go into the calm equanimity, you know, Yeah. once the kids are there to cement them together, because kids do cement them together, no mm -hmm. doubt about it. But it's <coughs> six of one, half a dozen. Go ahead, please. Yes, good morning, Jack. <coughs> Yep. Yes, good morning. Uh, Sven Robinson, I have uh, just want to commend you on uh, your work with the bill, and uh, I'm also a father who's divorced and uh, have custody and access to my children, and uh, I'd just like to uh, say that uh, I'd like to see a little more support for men in this situation. Uh, that seems like the media and newspapers and things always plays it up that the man is the bad guy in a situation, and uh, I love my children very much, and want to see them as much as I can and uh, I just like to see that there's more rights in there for the father and uh, to see this uh, included in the act and that's uh, just like to commend you on any work in that area. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead please. Morning Jack. Um, I was just curious about what happens after the ex-wife who is collecting the child support remarries. Does she still go on collecting support or what happens? I'll yeah. hang up for your answer. <clears throat> Yeah, she can still collect support, but what can happen then is that the, uh, the father can come back to the court and say, look, her circumstances have changed, she doesn't need as much money, and he can seek a variation of that order. Go ahead, please. Uh, good morning. I have a question regarding uh, 
adopting a child. I've recently married a woman who was divorced about seven years ago, mm -hmm. and her uh, her husband has never made any supports, never made any support payments, although he was required to according to the divorce. And I'm interested in adopting the child. I'd like to know whether or not he can uh, contest that or uh, what the responsibility is. Uh, yeah, okay. In, in terms of an adoption, that is under, entirely under provincial law. It's not under federal law at all. It's not affected by the Divorce Act. Uh, if there is an adoption, though, that cuts out any rights of the other, uh, of the other uh, uh, parent. Of the, yeah. father, the original father. That's right, yeah. Thank you very much. Well, uh, Mark, is this uncontested? Yeah. Um, from one of the, the law places advertised in Vancouver today, $400 will buy you a complete divorce service, completely lawyer handled, uncontested. Lawyer appears in court. Disbursements will add another hundred bucks, five hundred dollars. Yeah. yeah, that's if you shop around from the ads, because some of the legal that's profession right. have realised that competition is good for business. Yep, yep. Well, okay, Sven, very useful information indeed. Do keep me in touch with the divorce bet, but you're saying right now that early in the new year mm. we will have the amendment to the divorce act, which will allow divorces after a period of separate and apart. There's no more three and five, is there? No more three and five. Remember, it's it now used one. to be three if if he walked out and five if you walked out, That's right? That's right, yeah. So now it's one for either side. One for either side, yeah. And that wipes out all the messy grounds if you want to wait a year from the date of your wedding. That's correct, yeah. What else? C49, we'll give it a test and we'll see how badly bungled this amendment has been or uh, how bad the whole idea of an amendment was. My thanks to... You know, I'm not going to say it. <laughs> My thanks to Sven Robinson. I'll be back after the break. I attempt to simplify a very complicated story, but I always was of the sure and certain knowledge that to control hunting lands for wildlife in British Columbia, you had to be a Canadian citizen, and that this could not be alienated to non-Canadians. I'm wrong. In the studio from Fort St. John is a fascinating man by the name of Peter Dumlich, correct? That is correct. How old are you, Peter? I am 43 years old. What is your profession? I'm a full-time time trapper up in this uh, area between Fort St. John and Fort Nelson. What has happened to your trap lines lately? <laughs> I'm actually an ex-trapper because the government has succeeded, or the judicial system of this uh, country has actually succeeded in pulling the only employment which I have and which supports my family and myself right away out from underneath my feet. And right now, as there is very little other employment available up north where I live, the only thing I can dig in into the snow over the winter time and live off some meager provisions which I have and hope for the summer to come so I could find a job up there. Are you, is your son presently lifting your trap lines? Yes, my son right now has the orders to pull all the traps which we had uh, set out in preparation for a fur harvest for this season. And he, right now he is busy pulling all these traps in and hanging them up on the trees again where they don't belong during the trapping season. Now, um, a number of people admire you very much because of the fact that you did a lot of your own legal work in fighting this through to the Court of Appeal of British Columbia. Is that correct? Well, that is correct. I spend my life savings in cash to fight this case uh, from the, to sue the Supreme Court of British Columbia. You got a good decision in the Supreme Court? Yes. Saying that, that you had a right to the trap line? That is correct. And then I went to the Court of Appeal and you lost? That is correct. And unfortunately, I cannot agree with the judgment by these uh, three uh, uh, appeal judges for the simple reason I, as a layman, I'm a trapper, I'm not a lawyer, I can find at least five instances, five sentences, which are based not on fact, but which are based on not true items. That's an argument we can't have here, but the fact remains is that the Court of Appeal has said, broadly speaking, correct me if I'm wrong, that if the government of British Columbia wants to keep uh, the, the wildlife hunting, hunting preserves, in the hands of Canadian citizens entirely, it'll have to change the law because there's a big hole in the law right now. Well, is that, that correct? That is what the court says, yes. Okay, now well, that, we've got to take that. And you were refused leave to appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada. That is correct. All right, now, we, let's go back up to Fort St. John. A German, is it a company or partners or a group? Well, there are two German business people who formed a Canadian uh, company, a British Columbia company, as a fa matter of fact, 
and they purchased two existing hunting outfits over a period of two years, I think, conglomerated this into one company and are now in the business of providing hunting services for non-Canadian hunters under the Fish and Wildlife For non-Canadian hunters? Non-Canadian hunters. You mean hunters. all, how big is this area? This bay area is about 150 miles long and about, as an average, you can say about 40 miles wide. So it's 150 times 40. That's 6,000 square miles. It is a little kingdom. A little kingdom. Now, that is correct. And this is reserved, you tell me, did this come out in evidence, or do you know it for sure, reserved entirely for uh, hunters who, from Germany or from Europe who pay for the right to shoot what? The license these two Germans hold to a nominee of theirs right now for hunting gives them the right to guide non-Canadian hunters in this area. But as this same area is Crown land, BC residents are also allowed to hunt on the same lands. Now, as you see, there are two different groups of hunters, the resident and the guided non-resident, which is hunting with the guide and outfitter hunting over the same area. In other words, they, the Germans sell packages in Europe and people come out here and hunt. That but is they, correct. They surely cannot stop me with my tag bought from the local wildlife office from going in with my rifle and shooting my quota, can they? Well, legally they cannot, but there are ways of uh, getting back at you, I think. You see, what happened to me personally, and I can only repeat what happens to me personally, <coughs> I was in the position, I, I was managing this outfit for them up there, I had my, resident, my hunting license, I had my tag, and I shot a moose for my own consumption. And you should have heard what these owners told me about this type of thing, because they said this moose should have been shot by a person we brought over to hunt. In other words, uh, they would take the atti same attitude you feel to other Canadian hunters and say, these moose are reserved for our customers and not for local Canadians. That is correct. Am I overstating it? Oh, I don't think so. No, no you don't. Because I was working for them and they gave me a hard time. You had a row with them, but that's beside the point. When the Germans took over the operation, you got, no, they registered the trap line in the name of the Canadian who worked for them then, correct? That is correct, yes. You came along in 1981 and the trap line was registered in your name. That was correct. It was, uh, or that is correct. It was part of a business arrangement. I was quitting in order to work for them, a very safe uh, job, which I had held for roughly 12 years. And I asked these people because they were not only employing myself and they were asking me to move away from my residence to go up there uh, for any securities they could post in case they don't like my face after, let's say, six months or a year. So they said they are in control of a trap line, which they would sign over into my name. And uh, if our business arrangement fails, I should feel free to keep this trap line for myself. In other words, you feel, and they deny it, that the trap line was yours as a Canadian in your name, not just in trust for them. Oh, no, I never held this trap line in trust. That is one of the problems, and because it, I don't have it in writing. You see, it was a gentleman's agreement. Right. So in the speak. spring of 83, you, they fired you after some round. That is correct, It wasn't yes. because you shot the moose. Oh, no, no, no. That was not the reason. And they, you wanted to keep the trap line, and they refused. They demanded the trap line license back. That is correct. They stated that they had given this trap line to me in trust, and that I should therefore okay. return it to a nominee of theirs, because they cannot hold this trap line. Yeah, themselves. the law says that they must turn it to a nominee. Because they are non-Canadians. Uh, may, may I interrupt? The law didn't say it then. Now the law would say this. At that time, this nominee business was sort of a black market affair. Fish and Wildlife knew about it. I remember. But I remember. they all closed their eyes. Now with the present court decision, we are in a position where this type of thing is a legal thing. And that is why I'm here to talk to you about it. Now, uh, in the Supreme Court, the judge ruled that uh, the transfer of the, of the license from the Palmas to German. Was that the license for the whole place? Well, the, uh, the licenses are basically, which, the licenses which got transferred consist actually of three licenses. In the contract, a personal trapping license of Mrs. Palmer was uh, transferred. The registration to the trap line, which is also a license, was transferred. And the registration to the guide and outfitting area, which is also a license, was transferred. To to those two people. Mm -hmm. The only problem, or was sold, I should say, was sold to those people. Now, the Wildlife Act of British Columbia states that licenses are non-transferable by private people, only by the Crown, which makes this contract actually illegal. 
Uh, that's, uh, that's if, you, if your interpretation of this entire thing is right, I agree with you. Anyway, the judge ruled that you held the trap line. That I should keep the trap line, yes. And the Court of Appeal turned it down. That is correct. Peter um, Dumalich, this is of great interest to hunters throughout British Columbia, because especially if any non-resident owners or non-Canadian owners feel that all, and I'm not suggesting they necessarily do, feel that all the wildlife there is for their customers and not for local Canadians. After the break. So the Supreme Court said you were entitled to the registered trap line, correct? That is correct. Just so the Court of Appeal that. said no. Now, what's happening to your license now? Have you turned it in yet? No, I am, that's why I'm right down in Vancouver now. I'm planning to go to Victoria and give this license directly to the minister for the simple reason I feel that the court decision has made me part of a, well, what I consider an illegal transaction because I am also ordered by the court to ask the Fish and Wildlife authorities, you know, that adds the insult also, to turn this license over with a request to have it reissued into the nominee's name of those two foreign speculators, which in my opinion, and I'm only a trapper, is strictly against the Section 43 of the Wildlife Act. I can see that, but at the same time, what you call these foreign speculators, uh, uh, to my knowledge, are competent, or to my belief, they'd be competent operators bringing in several hundreds of thousands of dollars of income into British Columbia, bringing in these wealthy German hunters, and I can well imagine this government in Victoria saying, ah, we're kind of glad they've won the case because we wouldn't mind selling some more of these uh, rights to non-Canadians in Europe, would we? But yeah. they, must, uh, they still must have a Canadian nominee, am I correct? Well, according to the existing law, that would be the only way out. Registration of a trap line on Crown land may be granted to a person who is a citizen of Canada or has the status of a permanent resident of Canada. Yes. That's an individual, not yes. a company. But what about this one? If a dispute arises as to the priority of rights of a trap line, the matter shall be determined by the regional manor, manager who may alter, eliminate, or reassign. Did you have an arbitration by the regional manor? No, manager? Unf unfortunately, Mr. Willett from Prince George, he's a regional minister, he was approached by the two Germans to arbitrate this, but he never took any direct action and he allowed this thing to go into court, which was very unfortunate because, you see, we are not dealing with the ownership of a piece of soap or something like this. This is a very, very important thing yeah, because of the wildlife management involved. You're a, yeah, well, they must follow the wildlife laws. Well, they certainly do, but there are complete different ways if you run a complete uh, trap line or a hunting outfit as an owner operator with the interest of preserving game so you can hunt the next year as well. That's what they'll be doing. Are you so sure about this? An investment really is only to get the hunters in, get them their moose, and then when the, when the thing is over, well, who cares? They have an investment perhaps in Africa as an next. That is my opinion. You mean it. that the, the foreign ownership might just clean out an area and go? Well, I can only tell Except you... Except that they've got, to, they've got to keep the capital value of, the, of their investment. How much, you don't know how much they paid for it, do you? Well, I think they paid for the one outfit $350,000. Oi! $350,000? Yeah. Yes. It's a tricky one. Uh, their position is that they are... And the Court of Appeals position is that they are entitled as non-residents to hold this license, am I correct? And to have a nominee for just the trap line or for the trap line and the guiding? Or for the guiding. They have right now so also a nominee for the guiding. So foreigners can buy out the interests of big game hunting in British Columbia. That's the word I've been looking for all morning. Big game hunting, as long as you use Canadians as nominees. Well, that is correct. And they say of you that, they, that you're a man they fired and that they had not they given you in trust or any other way the permanent holding of the trap well, line. Well, that is, that is what they say, yes. Well, I'm concerned about it because it does seem to me that it certainly would inhibit the local Canadian hunters from going on land virtually controlled by non-Canadians, right? Well, that is uh, part of the problem I here, want to yes. talk to this man from Prince George. We've got a couple of calls here on the point, I hope. Go ahead from Prince George to Peter Dumlich. Okay, Jack. Uh, good morning to you and your guest. Um, I've heard it in uh, Germany and France, and uh, also in Quebec. 
And I've run into... Uh... Hello, Jack? Yeah, carry on. Make a point, though, please. Okay, uh, the, well, he, what he, your guest was saying uh, about them keeping other hunters out of the bush. But you're talking about Germany and France. Yes, but That's in like Canada, they will, they will do that by intimidation. Has it ever happened to you? In Quebec, it has, sir, yes. You run into a private uh, hunting area and big signs, stay out, uh, prosecute. You will be prosecuted if you get into that. Thank you. Well, there was an attempt made here in the Arrow Lakes a number of years ago when Bob Williams was the Minister of Forests to put up gates and close off all access to Canadians. But when I pointed out to Williams many years ago, and it was a German consortium that owned that place, the gates were rapidly removed. You had to go to this company to get permission to shoot on their land. It's just like Scotland, you know. Dreadful. Horrible. Go ahead, please. Yes, good morning. Uh, Mr. Dumalich, I, uh, I, I'm basically in agreement with what he has to say here, but this is the first time you've had anybody on from that area up there who really knows, or should really know, what, all, what it was all about when Mr. Watson and the Greenpeace people went up there over the wolf kill. Because I think we were, everywhere they go is a media event, and I would like to have the opinion of somebody who absolutely knows what's going on. About what? About the wolf kill and what really happened there. Never no, mind the I'm, media bunk. Unless you want to give me a short report on that, Peter, I'm not terribly interested in it. Well, moment. all what I would say is we do have a wolf problem up there. I don't agree with the helicopter hunts. I think the trapper really is a person uh, who should uh, control the wolf problem and with some help from the government, of course. And I feel, you know, that right now the Department of Fish and Wildlife is justified in uh, hunting those wolves down because they are causing actually a lot of problems up there with, uh, she with sheep, moose and caribou. Uh, the Greenpeace Foundation, you will be delighted to hear, is paying $25,000 in an out-of-court settlement to the big game guide outfitter on Sp who operates in Spatsizi Plateau. You remember they flew in and harassed. Yes, yes. So Collingwood Brothers Guide Outfit has got $25,000 out of court. That'll teach them a little bit of a lesson. Because big game hunting is a big business in British Columbia. It sure is. It, is. it sure is, Jack, yes. Uh, but I don't know what we can do for you. The only thing that can be done for you is that the government might change the law clearly. But they, we were speaking to some government people yesterday, and they don't want to change the law. Mm -hmm. They're happy to have the Germans. Yes. Now, if the Germans control it properly and allow Canadians to hunt without harassment, should we complain? The Germans buy hotels down here. The Germans, the Brits and the Germans and the Chinese have lots of investments. Why is this investment any different? Well, the investment is different from the point of management, managing the game pres uh, reserves you have. I would like to make a point here if you give me a second. Please, please. What happens is, on this trapline business, for instance, uh, if the Wildlife Act here, 43, states that only one person is allowed one trap line. Correct. Now, if the, if the nominee business would be allowed, uh, as it is right now being allowed by the Appeal Court of British Columbia, Fish and Wildlife would lose any control over saying, OK, how many trap lines or how many outfits does one person actually hold? Because on each outfit or trap line, there is a name of a nominee, which is completely misguiding Fish and Wildlife for proper management and proper looking after according to the Act. In other words, you as a nominee, um, do they have to have nominees for the, for the hunting section of the license too? Oh yes, they do. So you would, you would be the nominee when you worked for the Germans for the three different licenses? No, 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 they held, they had a nominee for, up in Fort St. John for the hunting outfit or for the hunting registration. Right. And the trap line was not given to me as a nominee, it was given to me as a security. In but please let me continue what, I was, what I'm trying to say here. Now, only, uh, let's say, o uh, a whole group of business people now, only limited by their financial backing, could quite obviously gain control of most of the trap lines in British Columbia okay. and the other provinces and therefore have a monopoly on the fur. Okay, I've got that. Uh, he's saying that this hole in the act could mean that our fur trapping, our big game hunting could ha fall into non-Canadian hands unless the provincial government changes legislation. Well, that is Peter, correct. Peter, it's the most time I can give you this morning. I'm glad you came here. 
Uh, and I welcome contributions on this particular subject from anyone, but not at the moment. You're now going to Victoria to hand in your trap line. That is correct. With yes. the look of disgust on your face. My You're thanks back. to Peter Dumlich from Fort St. John. I'll be back with um, Remembrance Day, Remembrance after the break. Thank you, Jack. Old soldiers never die, never die, never die. Least of all, George Campbell, Dominion Vice President of the Army, Navy, and Air Force Veterans of Canada, and Lou Edwards, Provincial Vice President of the Army, Navy, and Air Force of Canada. I knew you were in charge of something, you two, but I didn't know you were in charge of vice. <laughs> <laughs> we do very well Someone at it. Someone has to do it, Jack. Now, how, you, how many, how many uh, old soldiers are left nowadays? It's getting on a bit. You know, most of the First World War guys have gone to that the great award, haven't they? That's true. That's true. Uh, How many members? How is the Army and Navy and uh, Navy Air Force and Vets of Canada doing? Well, nationally, we have a membership of between forty and forty-five thousand, uh, probably, um, or somewhat a little less than half of them are actually war veterans, as such, Jack. Uh, now, because you have a fair number of decent projects going. Tell me about something you're doing in Vancouver just now. Well, the latest thing that we're doing, and I say we do this in conjunction with the Royal Canadian Legion and the Department of Veterans Affairs, is to construct this. Do you see that? Uh, housing unit. Uh, it'll be on Alexander Street, just east of Main Street. Uh, the purpose behind it arose because of some veterans who are living down on what is described as Skid Road in pretty poor circumstances. Well, that's great stuff. And this will be subsidized, lo subsidized rent, won't it? Yes. The, living the under allowances. Controls, yes. Right. What else are you up to in the Army and Navy vets? Well, I'm in charge of publicity for British Columbia, so we got lots going. I have the provincial color party. If you could show that, well, we what, attend what? we attend most parades in British Columbia, uh, Chilliwack, White Rock, uh, all the veterans parades, and so on. And uh, we do a pretty good job of that. You sure do. And you raise money for housing. What else do you raise money for? Shaughnessy Hospital. What do you do at Shaughnessy? One hundred and ten thousand dollars to the. Actually, we took on the project of equipping one of the laboratories in the aging uh, research project that's going on at Shaughnessy, Jack, and about $120,000 we raised to equip one of the laboratories. It, mind you, well, it's not officially a vet's hospital anymore. I presume that most vets still go there. Is yes. that right? Yeah. There is a special unit called the Brock Farney Pavilion, uh, named in honor of Dr. Farney, and it's, they're principally veterans, and they're aging veterans. Now, uh, the usual memorial day. I still call it Armistice Day. Why is that? I do too. It's a Remembrance Day now. But it was Armistice Day when you were a boy in Scotland, well, yes, wasn't that's it? That's right. Mind you, you're a veteran of the first war. Oh, I'm a veteran oh, of the second no. war. Is that not right? Well, it was very difficult for me, Jack. I was born in 1920, but oh. I was educated in the first world war. Yeah. Well, I'm a war baby from the first war. <laughs> I'd like to see that little picture, that cartoon you did for me, which I think is very funny. But I don't seem to know on the big one. Oh, there it is up there. Jack, see what it says there. Jack, what does it say? I know what I like about your program. It ends precisely the same time the pub's open. <laughs> this is Andy Cap telling us that Webster finishes at half past ten whenever the pub's open. There's a little Cap badge for you. How come you've got an Andy Cap uh, unit 26 of the Army, they Navy, and Air Force? Been, they've just taken on that name and... No by the way, this picture was done by Comrade Ron Robinson. Uh, he does all kinds of things for us on our conventions and any time we need them. My yeah. thanks to Ron Robinson. I'll treasure that one. Andy Cap looks like Andy Cap, and Webster <laughs> looks like Webster 20 years ago. Ron was very nice to me. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you came in. I hope that everybody buys their poppies this year. We oh, sell poppies for the Real Royal Canadian Legion. We don't have the poppy fund in our, our units, but we cooperate with the Royal Canadian Legion all the way down the line. Uh, our ends are to the same thing, practically. We're all striving for the good of wet veterans. And you're, and you're looking after vets, and you're building housing for them, and you help the hospitals, and you do everything you possibly can. We have a big year next year coming up. Centennial year, we're taking over Mo Memorial Park for one day. And all the net proceeds for this one day are going to the downtown Memorial Veterans Housing. Good. So, there, my time is up, and my thanks to George Campbell. Jack. 
Uh, my thanks to Lou Edwards. With two L's. L-L-E-W, <laughs> Llewellyn Edwards. That's right. And buy a poppy for Remembrance Day. Remember the two-minute silence, and I'll be back after the break. Canada's favorite politician, Jean Chrétien, will be here Tuesday morning. I'm back Monday, of course, with the best of Webster, which is very good indeed, don't miss it. And I'm back again Tuesday, Monday and Tuesday at 9 a.m. precisely. If I had a pair of scissors, I'd cut your tie off. Oh, I'd do more than cut his tie off. <laughs> Any moment now, I'm liable to dissipate into nothingness and float off into the air for an out-of-body experience. You are sleepy. <laughs> Fally Mort. Boy, what a publicity hound he is. Par excellence. Oh, if that doesn't Quiet, be... please. Ah. We've spoken to how much is the book? Somebody shout. How much? You see how little interested in money I Take am? Take another shot of the book. <laughs> <laughs>